Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. This is the second, the first, sorry, of a two-part series, and both of which will have two papers. The first session will concentrate on East Asia, and the second one on Southeast Asia. We ask um, Oscar Saleming to speak first. Um, he actually has a strong connection to Southeast Asia, but he will speak on Shanghai and East Asia. Um, Oscar did his PhD um, on research in Vietnam um, at the University of Amsterdam um, and has an ongoing interest in Vietnam and Thailand. He worked at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam for 10 years and he is now at the University of Copenhagen. Um, today, Oscar will speak about the city of art, state market, and the urban reinvention of Shanghai. Oscar, thank you. Thank you, Florian. Um, let me just get this right. Uh, I hope I'm audible, uh, and thank you for uh, listening. My paper looks at the overnight um, uh, urban transformation of Shanghai against the backdrop of state market dynamics, urban regeneration, interurban competition, and the aspiration to become a global cosmopolitan city, also and especially in the cultural sphere, namely of contemporary arts. I will argue that this concentrated drive to become a global center for contemporary art came at the heels of the 2010 World Expo, which, with the slogan, I quote, better life, uh, better city, better life, unquote, signaled Shanghai's aspirational status as the next great world city through public-private partnership. Yet, this combination of cosmopolitanism and commercialism harks back to, the, to Shanghai's colonial history as an international concession city as well. Semi-colonial, uh, Shanghai is a semi has a semi-colonial history as a treaty port since uh, 1840. Um, and therefore, its history of the 19th and early 20th century could be characterized uh, in terms of a hierarchical, racialized, and gendered multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism. And this past is cherished in present day Shanghai, which presents itself as China's most cosmopolitan city. There's colonial nostalgia in art in architecture, in public spaces, in popular culture. Examples uh, abound. The Bund, uh, the heritage of, uh, uh, of Shanghai, for example, the Lilong uh, alleyways. Um, uh, art, uh, for example, uh, more nostalgic, impressionist-infused uh, uh, art, um, etc. Since 1978, China opened up with the economic reforms, first in Shanghai and the new city, city of Shenzhen near Hong Kong. Uh, Jacob Dreyer says that the opening up inaugurated a competition between two urban models, uh, the inland capital of Beijing versus the port city of Shanghai, both striving for global city status in the Saskia Session uh, sense of the term. And key moments in, uh, in, for both cities uh, were the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and the Shanghai Expo in 2010. But global city status, uh, if it wants to go beyond demographics, um, um, industrial production and uh, finance, it needs a thriving culture and art scene. Uh, and for that to happen, it needs also an attractive heritage environment, um, which was recognized early on by the city administration. And um, so I'll skip some things. Um, so I hope you don't mind that I'm trying to figure out what I uh, try to say. Um, since 1979, our China also opened up artistically. And 1979 could be uh, seen also as the, as the birth of Chinese contemporary art, which has become booming really from around 2000 onward. Uh, in in uh, Beijing is not just the political capital, but 
in many ways also the cultural and artistic capital of China in terms of its institutions and in terms of its artistic production. The institutions in terms of the museums, the central art academy and um, in production in terms of artist studios and galleries. In Shanghai, um, um, there's uh, since the early 2000s then uh, there were uh, new uh, areas came up, new neighborhoods, Beijing 798, uh, Chengde. so the first studios and then galleries and then museums came up there. Um, for example, this UCCA uh, private museum. In Shanghai, there's no major uh, art academy, although the uh, China Art Academy in Hangzhou is quite close. Um, and it did have an art museum, but uh, that was a little bit derelict in the former colonial Hippodrome building of what's now People's Park. Um, from 2005, um, there was, there is, and still is, the Shanghai Museum of Contemporary Art, which is set up uh, as a private museum run by the Hong Kong based jade trader Samuel Kong. Um, but then there are also more say jazzy or uh, under, or, or um, um, uh, progressive art scenes in old industrial sites like M50 um, or Morgan Shan Road 50, an old textile mill uh, and Red Town, uh, an old uh, ironware works factory. So this is in uh, M50, quite a few galleries have set up there following uh, the, uh, the artists that first came in to set up stud studios in, these, uh, in this area. Um, this is a, a maquette of, um, um, of Red Town uh, with, for example, the Shanghai sculpture space and also a Minsheng or, uh, Bank uh, Museum. So in other words, it was a reuse of industrial buildings at a time when heritage was discovered. Um, so from around 2000, uh, Shanghai, uh, perhaps more than other cities in China, moved away from the bulldoze and build urban redevelopment to a re-evaluation of colonial era buildings and neighborhoods. For example, those alleyways, the Lilo. Um, so uh, the redevelopment of Lilung, Lilung through con cons conservation, commercialization, and gentrification, um, it uh, also uh, uh, was uh, made to, uh, to use and to profit in commercial, uh, commercial areas like Sintiende and Tianzifan, both in the form of French concession. It's part of a general sense of what you might call colonial nostalgia. And I don't uh, uh, dream up that term myself. It's been used by people like Dreyer or non uh, Akara Pasetku. Um, so uh, a few examples could be, for example, um, these kind of uh, posters that are fairly ubiquitous um, or sometimes also in public spaces uh, there were there was a um, uh, impressionist uh, posters at one of the major major metro stations about um, uh, the connections between paris and shanghai before the second world war so these kinds of um, uh, paintings impressionist paintings so shanghai's ambition is to become a global city. One might say again, from the Bund here to the West Bund, to uh, Pudong on the other side. So I now move to uh, the Olympics and especially the Shanghai World Expo. Because one avenue for expressing not only uh, national but global city aspirations is the organization of large scale global events. Um, that uh, is not just the organization of an event, but it requires the building of infrastructure, the organizing of uh, lo logistics, of ac accommodation, of hospitality, communication networks, etc. And it allows for the self-representation of China through spectacular architecture, 
uh, in Beijing, one might think about the Bird's Nest Stadium uh, designed by RA, uh, and shows like the uh, opening for the, of the uh, Beijing Olympics by Zhang Yimou. Um, the, uh, the uh, Beijing Olympics in 2008 meant also a big boost to the 798 Arjun. Um, so um, many new international galleries came to China. Uh, the UCCA Museum uh, was uh, not set up, was set up one year earlier, but uh, confirmed its, its status. It was visited by international dignitaries like uh, Jacques Chirac, the former uh, French president and other heads of state. So it became also a new and buzzing uh, destination for art professionals, uh, for collectors, for curators. And increasingly also, it's becoming an emerging tourist destination. Now to the uh, Shanghai World Expo. Uh, it was a major operation. Um, 200, 246 countries, corporations, and international organizations participated with uh, 99 country and territory pavilions. Uh, it was the most expensive expo, world expo ever, and it um, uh, keeps a world record of more than 73 million visitors, of whom more than 4 million foreigners. So as I said before, its slogan was better city, better life, which signifies uh, Shanghai's new status in the 21st century as the next great world city. And I quote from uh, one of the policy documents. Um, the Shanghai Expo uh, is yet another first rate global scale event, similar in significance to the Beijing Olympics, which would symbolize the economic and political rise of China in the 21st century. The event would demonstrate to both the Chinese populace and foreign nations the enormous progress of China's urban development in the heart of the nation's economic hub of Shanghai." Unquote. So uh, in terms of infrastructure, one can could think about the new airport in Pudong, the greatly expanded metro network, um, and uh, also the redevelopment of the old harbor um, area on the uh, Hangpu River. Uh, both sides of the river. The closure of the expo left behind that in transport infrastructure, but also the pavilions, as well as the so-called city mall, which is can be seen over here. Uh, this is the arena. This is now the China Art Museum, which uh, means that some of the pavilions uh, uh, are being reused. Uh, this is the China Art Museum. Um, the French Pavilion became a Minsheng Art Museum. Um, the Shanghai World Expo Cultural Center became the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Um, the Exhibition and Convention Center became uh, the site for a, an art fair, the Shanghai Art Fair. And the old refurbished power station in Pusi became uh, the power station of art, a bit like uh, the Tate Modern in London, one could say. It was the first state museum in 2012 that was dedicated to contemporary art. Um, and it opened, and that's uh, significant, with artworks from the Centre Pompidou. I'll return to that later. Um, so it's now also home to the Shanghai Biennale, one of the major art events in the world today. So, and it's just uh, northeast from the Westbound area. Its director, Gong Yen, uh, is quoted uh, as saying uh, that culture is ever growing soft power. Now, if you think about the Westbound, it's an 11 kilometer uh, waterfront, uh, which consisting of old uh, industrial uh, sites, port, factories, an old airport, um, that are now, that's now in the process of being uh, revamped to, um, to cultural sites, uh, creative industries, entertainment centers, um, for example, and a number of museums, mostly private museums, for example, the Long Museum. 
It's set up by this uh, billionaire real estate couple of uh, Liu Yichen and Wang Wei. And um, their, um, one of their three museums, uh, the one on in Westbund, is designed uh, by Atelier Deshaus. Um, their collection is diverse. One of the main or the most uh, best known uh, pictures is this one. Uh, painting is this one, the uh, Reclining Nude by Modigliani, which uh, they bought for 170 million uh, US dollars at an auction in November 2015. Um, the, um, they try to involve uh, internationally famous curators for their shows. For example, uh, somebody like Hans Ulrich Oblist. Um, but in general, one could say that their uh, exhibitions are not quite daring. So they cover uh, many different periods, periods and they stick uh, to a political script, um, which also meshes with the uh, expressed aim of Wang Wei, um, namely uh, to show that Chinese art and Asian art in general is equal or equivalent to Western art. Another one is the Yuz Museum. Um, in this former uh, hangar of the airport, uh, it's set up by Buditek, the collector, the Indonesian, uh, um, Chinese Indonesian uh, collector, um, who keeps his collection still in Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Singapore, uh, but uses the museum uh, to showcase his uh, collection, but also to uh, organize exhibitions. Uh, for example, in collaboration with uh, Hu Hung, Professor Hu Hung uh, of the University of Chicago, um, but also art professionals uh, such as Karen Smith. Um, Karen Smith is also uh, uh, connected up with SCOPE the uh, Shanghai Center of Photography. Um, uh, she manages that uh, on behalf of the, her uh, partner, uh, Liu Hong Xing, uh, who founded it. And it offers a small uh, exhibition space um, devoted to photography. But apart from that, there's quite a bit of uh, other uh, activities in the West Bond. There's an art center uh, which is also the site for the Westbond um, uh, Art and Design um, Fair. There's artist studios, uh, there's galleries like uh, Shanghai, uh, Zwierna, uh, etc. And then there's a bunch of, of other sites in the making. So here it shows on this map which ones are more or less uh, in the making. And I'm not going to uh, enumerate all those, um, um, but there's these interesting maquettes, these interesting um, uh, futuristic visions of how it should look. But one of the interesting um, um, uh, new developments is also this one, the uh, Sainte Pompidou, which will set up a dependency in, uh, in Shanghai. Shanghai, and uh, has been collaborating with Shanghai-based cultural institutions for a while now, loaning its uh, part of its collection for exhibitions in Shanghai. And then further afield, uh, I mentioned already the power station of art. Uh, there's the Rugland Art Museum. Um, uh, many of these private museums are connected up with uh, real estate and with urban development or re redevelopment, K11, with, uh, with uh, shopping centers, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, there are many but also Art 021 um, in the uh, 
uh, former Soviet palace, now the Shanghai Art Expo. Um, and um, so I'll stop there. I could go on with all the sites, but that's maybe not so interesting. I would like to uh, move to my discussion. Uh, in 2014, Shanghai hit the global art scene with the news of the opening of two private museums uh, on the West Bank, um, but also with the coming of the of prestigious art fairs and the Shanghai Biennale. So, uh, does this shift uh, signal a shift? Uh, um, so here is a, a, a sort of a, a, a GIF picture of the uh, 2016 Biennale. Um, and these art fairs are more or less simultaneous and also simultaneous with the Biennale. So it draws an enormous crowd from uh, not just China, but around the region and the world to, to Shanghai. Uh, this is a picture I took at a West Bond, uh, Art and Design Fair. Um, where uh, there were talks and talks about also global redevelopment or urban uh, redevelopment uh, uh, on waterfronts. One of the things that, uh, that the West Bank is trying to do. So um, does this signal a perhaps partial uh, shift of the art scene from Beijing to Shanghai? I would say only to a limited extent, uh, because it's more the consumptive part, the commercial part of the art scene that, uh, that is coming to Shanghai, or so it seems. Um, but um, as the biggest city in the world, it also aims to become a global city through its cultural offerings, maybe not its production, but its uh, exchange and trade in that. So that's partly predicated on the post-industrial transformation of colonial and revolutionary sites and buildings into heritage and art zones as sites of consumption, consumption of heritage and art and spaces of consumption as well. Uh, now with more than 800 billionaires and with growing numbers of Chinese art uh, collectors uh, purchasing both Chinese and international artworks. Both Chinese and international institutions, art professionals and artists cannot afford to look away. As uh, Girard Fajanato, who is the director at Zwerner, the, the International Gallery said, quote, being present in China, Shanghai uh, is now inescapable. There is no alternative. You simply have to be there, unquote. But there is more. In June 2016, the Shanghai government announced that the West Bank master plan and the Freeport, because they also hope to set up a Freeport, I quote, reflects the municipal government's ambition to make Shanghai a major international art center, unquote. With growing attraction for international expats and art lovers, collectors and professionals, Shanghai seeks to compete with Hong Kong not just as East Asia's financial center, but as its art center as well. A status that Hong Kong itself seeks to cement through uh, Art Basel Hong Kong, of course, and the M Plus Museum. At the same time, it seeks to compete with Beijing by claiming to be China's truly global city, namely as a city that's open, internationally networked and forward looking. This global city claim is predicated on a combination of cosmopolitanism and commercialism, which harks back to Shanghai's colonial history as an international concession city as well. And I'd like to keep it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oscar. Um, that was a really nice introduction to Shanghai. And a nice comparison indicated already um, looking at Shanghai, but also Hong Kong. <clears throat> I'm sure Sho Hua can relate to this in many ways. Um, she is a native of Shanghai and she will give the next presentation. Sho did her undergraduate degree in business and mathematics at UPenn and then joined us at the University of Hong Kong to work on the Hong Kong art market and the art fairs. 
after she did a three, four year stint in banking. So perfect preparation um, to speak to us today about the rise of the art fair in Hong Kong, a topic that's closely related to a PhD thesis. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Florian, for the wonderful introduction. And hopefully my presentation will be able to echo with um, um, Oscar's um, presentation as both Shanghai and Hong Kong are quite um, share a lot of similarity as well as competitive tension in between the two of the rising Asia's leading art hubs. And uh, before I start, I would like to share my screen, uh, making sure that, uh, sorry, yes, yes, share. So um, my presentation today will investigate the development of the international and regional art fairs held in Hong Kong over the past three decades, a period of time where the city has risen to become Asia's leading hub for the art trade. Based on a number of um, field work, interviews, and archive studies collected from Hong Kong's contemporary art market, hopefully this should offer some insights into the market emergence and globalization of Hong Kong's art trade ecology. So the port city of Hong Kong has long kept a historical role in facilitating and promoting the cultural and economic exchanges between the East and the West and enjoyed a simple and low tax system, as well as geogra geographic proximity to the increasingly affluent mainland. Art fairs are examined as ritualized collaborative activity constituted by the capacity of the art world actors to mobilize, diffuse, and negotiate over a range of operational conventions, transactional models, and concepts of space and power dynamics in the international art market. After the closure of the World War II, exhibitions in Hong Kong reached unprecedented vibrancy due to the influx of the Chinese artists, cultural elites, and wealthy patrons from the mainland. The incoming and constellation of the mainland Chinese art world actors preceded an inevitable cultural makeover and a gradual shift of the center of gravity for the Chinese art market from the mainland to Hong Kong. This community of emigre would partly um, leave their marks on the artistic life in Hong Kong, which in many respects has remained relevant today. They inaugurated a series of exhibitions, for instance, the Canton Exposition of Cultural Artifacts in 1940, uh, the Guangdong Wen Wu Zhan, and a number of cultural magazines and scholarly exchanges of art and connoisseurship practices. In addition to exhibitions held in restaurants, hotels, artist studios, new venues for exhibitions included the City Hall Museum and Gallery, which was the president of the Hong Kong Museum of Art, the St. John Cathedral, the Hong Kong Club, Chatham Gallery, and the Feng Ping Shan Library at the Uni of Hong Kong, made accessible to the ever-increasing art viewing public. The basic law, a reliable infrastructure, and technical know-how are the preconditions for Hong Kong's positioning as Asia's leading art hub. 20th century Hong Kong was an important crossroad facilitating the circulation, mobility, and exchanges of various artistic commodities. With the changing socio-political atmosphere in mainland China after 1949, the conventional practices of private art dealerships became largely obsolete. The market for art shrank as traditional art galleries with it. Chinese artists faced a tightening of control on their creativity and artistic production. To quote Chairman Mao's famous Yan'an talk, art should be in the service of people. In Hong Kong, however, the art and antiquity trade continued to grow and thrive with the flourishing merchant culture um, and the arrival of international galleries and auction houses, as well as the migration of the intellectual elites, artists, and patrons after the closure of the World War II. In the early 1960s, Dorothy Swan, a teacher at an high, at international high school, founded the Chatham Gallery, which was the colony's first commercial contemporary gallery. 
and provided space for then contemporary artists to exhibit and sell their artworks. From 1992 to 1995, Hong Kong held the first international art fair, Asia Art Hong Kong, International Fine Arts and Antiques Fair. The organizers were the couple David Lester and Leon Lester, North American Fine Arts and Antique Fairs impresarios. Most of the galleries represented Western, and modern, and contemporary paintings, although Asian pictorial art and other forms such as sculpture, installation, calligraphy, and antiquities, as well as other precious cultural curios, were also dealt and displayed at this fair. Western gallerists brought works ranging from 30,000 US dollars to 3 million US dollars, and from a variety of subjects. They expressed uncertainty about what to bring to the Asian art consumers. Of the over 80 galleries exhibiting at the fair, less than 10 were from the region of Asia, representing mostly modern and contemporary Chinese paintings and realistic oil paintings produced by then contemporary Chinese artists. The event provided opportunities for the Western dealers to test the Asian market at a time where the Euro-American market was facing stagnation or recession. The exigent question for the fair organizers and dealers who traveled long haul journey all the way to Hong Kong was whether this region had enough of a collector base to sustain the event. Due to the lack of resonance in the market, Asia Art did not continue after its fourth edition in 1995. Although the first art fair did not survive beyond the 1990s, Hong Kong's contemporary arts market nevertheless entered a phase of accelerated growth and witnessed a robust international interest in collecting and investing in modern and contemporary Chinese art. Many Chinese artists achieved soaring commercial success, realizing an unprecedented surge in the price in auction and gallery transactions. For instance, Wu Guanzhong, a preeminent 20th century Chinese painter working in both Chinese and Western style paintings, held his first major exhibition in Hong Kong in 1987. Shortly after, his ink painting, The Rooms of Gao Chang, fetched 1.87 million Hong Kong dollar at Sotheby's Hong Kong. Then, the highest result amongst all living Chinese artists. And two years later, a similar work, Ancient City of Jiao He, Jiao He was auctioned for $2.6 million. In the early 1980s, the artist price was as low as 50 or 100 RMB per piece. In less than a decade, Wu's paintings had come to realize prices of 200 million Hong Kong dollars. Hong Kong acted as the agent carrying referrals, recommendations, and cultural endorsement for experimental Chinese art towards the rest of the art world. In 1993, the exhibition entitled China's New Art Post-1989, mounted by the Hong Kong-based gallerist Zhang Songren Johnston Chang, um, owner and founder of the Han Art Gallery, um, which was also co-organized by the Hong Kong Art Center, prevented, presented a vivid spectrum of Chinese contemporary art to the international audience. Thanks to the ge a close geographic and cultural ties with mainland China, Hong Kong has become a crucial venue for presenting contemporary Chinese art and encouraged socioeconomic and cultural exchanges between the Chinese art world actors in the mainland and their international peers and interested buyers. The period of 1993 to 2007 has seen a speedy rise in the influx of international galleries, auction houses, commercial art spaces, and private museums in Hong Kong. When Andy Hay started the International Asian, Asian Antique and Art Fair in 2006, and when Magnus Renfro, Will Ramsey, and Tim Itchell opened the Art Hong Kong Fair in 2008, if, which eventually acquired was acquired by the Basel Group in 2012, Hong Kong's art market was finally ready to welcome this sufficient demand and interest to keep the events of art fairs running. The opening of the International Contemporary Art Fair entitled Art Hong Kong 08 marked the beginning of the era of art fairs in the city. Six international art fairs were inaugurated in Hong Kong during the period of 2006 and 2013. 
including the Fine Asia Art Fair started in 2006, the International Contemporary Art Fair started in 2007, Asia Contemporary Art Show since 2008, Art Hong Kong during 2008 and 2011, and Art Basel Hong Kong 2013, and Affordable Art Fair Hong Kong since 2013. Those fairs reconfigured the art scene by changing and redefining the convention and frequency of art exhibition and private dealership practices. Cultural and heritage tourism was identified as a prime field of opportunity and has been named as one of the four pillars of Hong Kong's tourism industry. The Hong Kong government has set aside 20 billion Hong Kong dollars for art and culture expenditure in 2019, compared with 840 million Hong Kong dollars two decades ago. In the meantime, the ambitious West Kowloon Culture District project introduces two new museums to the city's art infrastructure. The Hong Kong Palace Museum, a new branch of the Beijing-based Palace Museum, and M Plus, the city's first international museum of modern and contemporary international visual arts and design. The importance of art fairs in Hong Kong's cultural landscape was quickly recognized and legitimized by the authorities as it suited well into the city's vision and ambition to become Asia's leading tourist destination, as well as the international art hub for Asia and greater China. The Hong Kong-based art fairs have a larger presence of Asian galleries and bring both international dynamics and a distinct regional flavor that distinguishes them from fairs mainly based in the West. They increase the exposure of the galleries in Hong Kong and reinforce alliances between the galleries. During the art fair week, which is usually in March, the Hong Kong Gallery Association, an unofficial society of gallery owners in Hong Kong, jointly promote themselves via a series of art events. On gallery night, which was the night before the opening of Art Basel Hong Kong, the galleries host special exhibitions and open their doors to the public until midnight. As the international art market players gather during the fair week, they bring in the latest information, market insights, and new networks to the art world actors in Hong Kong. In addition, artists and collector talks, specialist conferences, seminars, guided tours to art studios and private art spaces, and many public art education initiatives are jointly organized by the association. Unlike the museum scene in New York, London, Paris, Beijing, and Shanghai, art museums in Hong Kong are less prominent in terms of the size of their permanent collection, as well as the number of total visits. Art fairs and associated art events thus assume a notable importance as key venues for public art exhibitions and art education initiatives as well. While regional art fairs such as Art Central, Ink Asia Art Fair have increased the presence of Hong Kong-based galleries Basel Hong Kong has witnessed a steady decrease in the presence of such local players. Art Basel Hong Kong 2013 featured 20 galleries from Hong Kong out of 245, and this figure dropped to 14 in 2019. According to my interview with a director and owner of a Hong Kong-based contemporary gallery specialized in promoting Hong Kong artists, which has participated in Basel Hong Kong and many other leading, Asia, leading art fairs in Asia, Art fairs are a helpful platform to showcase Hong Kong art to the international audience in order to actively engage with the purchasing habit of consumers. However, his gallery business still relies mainly on a group of loyal collectors, not necessarily overseas buyers that visit his booth during the art fair. To quote him, the buzz that the fair generates help bring more people locally to our gallery when they don't do so habitually. The emerging market art fairs facilitate the introduction of novel, novel players into the global art industry, providing galleries with access to a broader group of international collectors on the scale that would not be possible to the traditional gallery space. In the Greater China context, FEX fairs expedite the incorporation of mainland Chinese art world actors into the global art world. The fairs in Hong Kong in particular have developed into important platform for people to gather and perceive the development and state of the Chinese art world and to capitalize on the surge of buying interest coming from the mainland China. 
The ritual of going to the art fairs allowed the artwork actors in emerging markets, such as the mainland, to speedily acquire the skills of exhibiting, marketing, buying, and selling artworks, as well as the necessary etiquette of interacting and socializing with their international peers. Recent research on China's contemporary art market has identified the actors' shared reverence and interest in understanding and appropriating the operational models and conventional practices of the established Western markets. For contemporary Chinese artists, it is highly relevant if their works have been exhibited in Basel. To be shown in Art Basel Fair is seen on a par with exhibitions in major international biennials and prestigious art museums. Lucy, a Beijing-based gallerist specialized in promoting and marketing contemporary Chinese art since the early 2000s, said that her gallery was happy to participate in Art Central, a regional art fair based in Hong Kong, which she commented as less international, branded, and glamorous than Basel, but younger and with experimental spirit. When asked whether they had tried to get into Basel, Hong Kong, she responded with a sense of positive energy. Of course, everyone aiming at having an international clientele and exposure must try Basel, Hong Kong. We applied to Art Basel every year, but we were declined. First, we have to compete with established Euro-American mega galleries that have been in this market for decades and already have trustful, trusting relationships with the fair organizers. Second, the booth allocation for Asian dealers is small, making it even more competitive. We will continue trying, and as long as we accumulate experience in other international art fairs and show enough credibility and ability to represent well-known artists of high regard, one day we will find you will find us at the convention center in Wan Chai, which was the venue of Art Basel Hong Kong, instead of at the regional art fair. So this reveals a rational decision for continuous observation, benchmarking, appropriation, and tactful positioning and repositioning of the commercial gallery from emerging markets. Mimesis has become part of the condition for integrating into international art world for those emerging art market players. Key knowledge includes, but is not limited to the setup of the fair's organizational structure, operations, design of the booth, um, allocation of rent, lights installation, digital and social media marketing tools, as well as social etiquette at the various networking and social events during a fair week. The increased exposure to the international art world helps the emerging mainland Chinese participants to become increasingly open, adventurous, and entrepreneurial about selling and buying contemporary art, developing an appetite that reaches an unprecedented level of diversification. As Wu Li Sik, the famous Wisp collector of contemporary Chinese art, remarked, Chinese collectors are nowadays becoming more and more open-minded and worldly. They buy not necessarily the most expensive or famous pieces, but works that the same group of collectors would not have thought of 20 years ago. The investments that the galleries allocate to fair exhibitions have increased on the expense of traditional gallery space, leading to changes in the cost structure for operations. As the dealers are busy making arrangements for the upcoming art fairs internationally, the consumption and viewing habits changes. Digital catalogs and online marketing tools help present and interpret new artworks and create euphoria among consumers, making art investments increasingly accessible to the rapidly expanding art buying population from greater China's new wealth. The predictable and low tax system, the mature infrastructure of logistics, local know-how support, and the fact that both Chinese, English, are the official languages have made Hong Kong a suitable place for the Western art organizers to test the water and to land in Asia market. In an interview, a UK-based art fair organizer suggested that Hong Kong was their first stop in Asia. The long-term ambition was to learn about and access other Asian cities, especially those in the mainland. Here comes to my conclusion. Um, such conclusion. So the art market is facing unprecedented challenges in the midst 
in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cancellations of art fairs, closures of galleries, and a run of layoffs haunt the art industry globally. Due to Hong Kong's relative success in containing COVID-19, art fairs were safely held when events in other cities were called off. In June 2020, the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association partnered with 12 of the city's art galleries to stage a boutique fair. The Swiss giant um, Art Basel also held its only physical event of 2020 in Hong Kong. Held over a period of four days in November, the Hong Kong Spotlight by Art Basel featured 22 galleries. Art fairs will retain a central role in the global art market, with aggregate sales estimated to reach 16.6 billion US dollars in 2019. Hong Kong's experience in coping with transcultural encounters in the former colonial cultural landscape has positioned itself as a microcosm for, of the international art world. Art fair as an important form of the various um, newly imported urban art activity in East Asia society is one good example of how Hong Kong's growing international art networks have increased both the volume and speed in promoting and facilitating artistic commodifications. And I would like to end my um, talk now and will be open to a discussion and Q&A session. Florian. Thank you, Shaw. May I ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can see each other better? I would like to thank you and Oscar for your presentations and maybe um, start out uh, with the first question for Oscar. Um, knowing how important Hong Kong has been as an art market uh, for the last uh, many decades, and Shaw just referred to that again, um, could you tell us a little bit more about Shanghai right now and its dependence on Hong Kong as an art market, or maybe that's something that Shanghai left behind and it's working more with the West or with Western and, and other um, international galleries in Shanghai itself? Thank you very much, Florian. This is a, a very good question. Um, I think there's still a continued uh, dependence on Hong Kong. Um, primarily, I would say, because Hong Kong is a free port, a functioning free port, um, and which means that uh, both foreign and Chinese art collectors, they prefer to do their business, to do their purchases or sales or whatever uh, in Hong Kong rather than uh, China. It's extremely problematic to move artworks in, into and out of China. Um, as many uh, curators and collectors have found out. So that status is uh, and remains important. Um, uh, that status of Hong Kong remains important for Shanghai. There's this ambition that the West Bund would also become a free port, uh, but an ambition that has not been realized yet. Another problem that uh, Shanghai faces, um, and who knows, Hong Kong might face in the future as well, say with the, with the free port, now that the one country, two systems is, uh, is changing rapidly, um, is that, for example, uh, Buddy Tech, the founding, uh, uh, the founder of, of the Youth Museum, uh, he is suffering uh, from pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. That's not a, a, a secret. Um, and what he would like to do is to do something that, uh, say, rich people in the U.S., can do, namely to establish a non-governmental entity, a foundation of sorts, that could uh, hold this collection, or part of this collection, um, and uh, keep it into perpetuity. Um, the Chinese leg mainland legislation does not yet allow for that. Um, so a, an independent non-governmental institution governed by a board of trustees. Uh, that's his dream. Uh, he, to some extent, uses his, his own uh, mortality to put some pressure 
um, on um, uh, on the Chinese authorities, but so far to to no avail. And um, what happens then is that is what you know, we could see uh, happen with with Ulizik, whose dream it was the the Swiss collector, uh, whose dream it was to um, uh, to give back in his own words uh, when I interviewed him, give back uh, at least part of his collection to China. And he found that he could not really do that for a variety of different purposes. So now he partly donated, partly sold cheaply uh, um, two thirds of his collection to M plus. So that's the core now, uh, I think the Ulysses collection is the core now of the uh, M plus uh, collection. So in that sense, uh, there are some structural uh, problems. Um, that Shanghai faces as an art hub. Um, but then on the other hand, um, there's, um, there's perhaps integration in the global art market, as, as, as Shuo uh, mentioned. But it's not, um, one could say, a, a seamless integration. Um, there are still it's like communicating vessels with bottlenecks in between, um, if you see what I mean. And um, uh, the, um, uh, the valuation that's happening within the mainland is uh, influencing the prices of, of art uh, elsewhere, for example, Chinese art, but it's not quite the same and the other way around as, uh, as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that China cannot, uh, of course, it's a big player in the global art market, but it's much more than that. It's almost a, an art world onto its own, uh, a bit like the US uh, is to a lesser extent Europe, I would say. Um, and uh, that uh, means that uh, Shanghai, uh, can basically build up all these institutions with local capital, uh, attract uh, foreign um, uh, artworks, for example, through deals with, with the Centre Pompidou in Paris, um, in order to become a major art center uh, um, by itself, even regardless of its disadvantages in uh, the global art market. Does that answer your question? Yes, Oscar, thank you. Very convincing and very, um, very long indeed with a lot more information in detail. I thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions? And may I ask you to unmute yourselves and, and ask, maybe wave and ask. Yeah, Nora. Yeah, thank you, Oscar and Shaw. I want to um, maybe ask a question that, or a, a more open-ended question, but that's a follow-up to what Oscar was talking about. And this could apply to both of you, which is what is the um, interface between the local and the global? Um, Oscar has been talking about Shanghai as becoming a global city. And yet it also, of course, contains um, uh, museums of Chinese art and Chinese art collectors. And, um, and so, you know, and Hong Kong has first started as a, a hub for Chinese art and not so much local Hong Kong art. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate um, a little bit further on, based on your observations and research, is there tension between the local and the global? I mean, you're talking about relations between Hong Kong and Shanghai, but, or is, is it uh, much more fluid than that? Maybe I can answer first quickly and briefly. It's a very, very good question. And I kept being, asked and um, about, you know, this local global complexity during my food box. So the presence of Hong Kong art in the art market is, um, is um, I would say, 
it is also changing because when it comes to the art fairs, the presence of the, or for instance, in Art Basel, the presence of um, the Hong Kong based galleries percentage actually decreased from its inauguration, but the same amount of quota was being offered to mainland based galleries. Um, but at the same time, with the introduction of new international um, galleries and also fairs in Hong Kong, uh, there's also this rising interest from um, local fair organizers and galleries to participate in the scene because with uh, the local government has been promoting um, um, like the Hong Kong LCSD has been promoting um, and supporting um, the building of the introduction of more Hong Kong based um, um, entities for, for, for sponsoring like the local artists. But um, there's also another question, which is um, in Hong Kong, I've, uh, this is what I observed. It seems like the, that the local Hong Kong artists are more self-sufficient with the existing infrastructure. Um, uh, and also um, it's similar to Shanghai as in Hong Kong doesn't really have a lot of art academy itself. So um, Hong Kong is an art hub is really more for the art market players to engage in this international art trade. And then there's, um, although at the same time, there are different voices um, and different um, and demand to um, make more room and make more support and have more support for, for more of a local artist community. And it has been evolving and changing. And uh, uh, I think the, the changing political um, vibes in Hong Kong also make this question even more complicated. I think I, uh, may add to that. Uh, I fully agree with with Shuo. Uh, there's not one answer. It's not um, uh, the situation is very changeable. And apart from the changeability, there's also very different actors uh, involved uh, with different types of ambitions. Uh, so very often, artists not always, but artists aim to become better known. Um, to have a better market um, and in uh, at least for a while in China that meant uh, being attractive for foreign uh, collectors and, and, and gallerists uh, maybe no longer no longer so uh, or not necessarily so because there is now a growing demand um, also for uh, Chinese art that's not necessarily um, uh, participating in what Uli Zip calls a, a global art discourse. That's his uh, criterion, main criterion for, for uh, collecting art. Art that participates in a global art discourse wherever it's from. Um, so it's, it's the same with, with curators. Some are happy to showcase what's local or within a national uh, frame. Others are uh, more uh, like uh, one way, uh, aim to showcase uh, sort of the value of, say, national art, whatever that may mean, um, uh, you know, against the backdrop. There's these different uh, actors, these different institutions, there's museums, uh, there's curators, um, um, and definitely there's some friction, not always tension, um, there might be tension, but uh, uh, like I think in, Ho in, Ho in Schwo's um, talk, this ambition uh, that she highlighted on the part of a, uh, of say a medium-sized uh, Hong Kong-based gallery um, to participate in Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, perhaps there is some frustration there, perhaps not. Uh, I've, I've heard some frustration on the part of, of gallerists, um, uh, all sorts of frustrations, also that these art fairs were rip-offs and things like that. But um, so there's these frictions and tensions, but it's not the same tension uh, that you could sort of label between local and global. I think that's uh, that would be too perhaps generalizing. Thank you, thank you both. 
I think one aspect that makes both Hong Kong and Shanghai more into global cities is certainly the visibility of art. And with private collectors um, building up or opening up um, private museums that are publicly accessible, uh, many more institutions are now created in adding to maybe the more traditional Shanghai Museum of Art or Hong Kong Museum of Art and so on. And also in Hong Kong, where museums exist since the 1950s, um, there are a lot more private museums now, um, ones that that open up um, still recently. And so I think that is an important aspect that besides the the art market and the commercial market and private galleries, individual collectors also play this role locally that makes them more into global players in some ways by opening up a publicly accessible collection from which um, people in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, but actually I think also in many ways the world over benefit. Are there any more questions? If there are no other questions, um, Floyd, I have been crystal clear. I think you have been indeed, Oscar. If there are no more questions today, then I want to thank um, Shro and Oscar for your presentations and just announce that this mini series um, that is indeed organized by all four speakers today's and those from the next session, um, Nora Taylor and Ja Tod, are indeed um, organized these two events um, with me at the University Museum at Hong Kong U. And that I will put my email into the chat box if you have questions about this series or any other follow-up questions um, regarding today's event. We will continue in two weeks time on the 23rd of March with Nora and Jad's talk on Southeast Asian art. We will welcome you at the same time, another Tuesday in two weeks time. Stay healthy and take care and thank you for joining us today.